Hello, welcome to Mindful Biology. This is the fourth of five talks about fluidity. Last time we looked at the mammalian aspects of human life and how our bodies as mammals come into the world expecting close, supportive contact with other warm beings. This sense of being safe in the company of others is so important to our physiology that we are well advised to learn to cultivate a sense of connection that we can bring into our experience even when we're alone. And the last talk gave some examples of how that can be done. In this talk, we'll look at the energetic feel of a human body, how throughout our tissues there is an ever-present sense of vibrating aliveness that we can contact with our attention. Because this aliveness tends to be relatively stable, it can serve as a sort of refuge of safety as we work to continue our quest for greater equanimity and less suffering. So the cellular body is what I call this energetic aspect of human life, because I believe it relates to the trillions of cells that make up our bodies. And I'll explain why I think this makes sense and how it can help us in our practice of mindfulness. To recap, we've reviewed in earlier talks the so-called objective body, which is the body of concept and idea. So that's the body of science. When we study some function or structure in the body with biological methods, we are studying the body as if it were an object, hence the objective body. But the objective body goes much further. It's the body that we talk about when we say, my body hurts, or my body is so many inches tall, etc. It's closely connected with the capacity of the human mind to objectify reality, to separate it into categories and seemingly separate objects. Now we've also talked about the mammalian body, and this is the body of direct animal experience. So this is where we feel hunger and thirst and sexual desire and fear and anger and sorrow and joy. This is the body that moves through the world that we feel when we walk or manipulate objects in the environment. It's the body that is warm and the body that expects close contact with others. Next time, we'll talk about the universal body. This is the body that feels seamlessly connected with and a part of the cosmos at large. It may be an experience that we aren't terribly familiar with on a day-to-day -day basis. But it's present and available, and we can cultivate the capacity to connect with it more. But today we'll be talking about this cellularity in the body, the body of experience that I like to connect with the living cells that comprise our organism. So we've been talking about fluidity, which has brought up the topic of blood. Now, blood is a fluid that contains many cells. Most of them are what are known as red blood cells. That is, they carry oxygen and to some extent carbon dioxide back and forth between the lungs and the tissues of the rest of the body. So there is a red blood cell in its typical sort of iconic form. Well, there are other cells in the blood. In particular, there are a number of different kinds of immune cells that can be found in the blood. There are also cells that participate in clotting, the so-called platelets. In the next Mindful Biology series, I'll be discussing integrity in the body, which includes the body's capacity to protect itself with the immune system. And so some of these immune cells will be mentioned then. 
But for now, it's enough to know that they're present in the blood along with the red blood cells, which means they're present in the body. Of course, there are many other types of cells. But we can focus in this talk much of our attention on the cells that circulate in the arteries, capillaries, and veins of the body. And of course, those blood vessels, the arteries, capillaries, and veins, are themselves made of cells. And so there's this cellularity throughout the circulatory system that spreads to every part of our organism and that I believe contributes to the feeling of energetic aliveness I mentioned earlier. Now, why would individual cells contribute to feelings of energetic aliveness? In my biological training, they were often treated as biological machines which is to say they were considered to be mechanical, purely responding according to some kind of programming, but not having an interior experience, anything that we would recognize as a feeling state. Now here's a paramecium, a single-celled free living organism. So it is very similar in all of its structural and functional details to the cells in our own bodies. The main difference is that this cell lives on its own in an environment of fresh water, whereas our cells live in a vast collective. Well, as we look at this cell in its environment, it is moving around picking out bits of food. It seems reasonable to suppose that something is motivating this activity, some very rudimentary feeling of hunger and perhaps a feeling of satisfaction once food has been found and ingested. It's reasonable, in other words, to compare the behavior of the feeding single-celled organism with the feeding multicellular organism, for instance, one we call a swan, which is likewise sort of turning around in its environment, picking out bits of food. These days, no one would doubt that the swan feels hunger and that it gets satisfied when it finds food. Now the swan's cells are similar in every important way to the paramecium, the single-celled organism, and so it's at least reasonable, I think, to believe that the single cell of the paramecium has a much more primitive experience of hunger and satiety as the swan, but that they are the same in kind despite the difference in degree. Very hard to prove this one way or the other, but it's a useful supposition, as I'll explain in a moment. But first, let's look at some other examples. In this frame, we see two organisms in the center. One is green, effectively a plant-like creature, and the other is a single-celled, free-moving animal. Now, the animal finds the plant and attempts to absorb it. Here's a different view with the microscope, but we can watch this organism wrap itself around ingesting the green cells and attempting to internalize it and digest it, but it fails. The target of its hunger is simply too large and it has to abandon the task. So there's something motivating this attempt and there's also something that reaches a conclusion about the inability to complete the task and the necessity to abandon and move on. And personally, as a human who has taken on tasks that later proved too much that I had to abandon, I can identify with this process of an attempt and then an evaluation that leads to a different uh, plan of action. Or we can watch this amoeba as it streams more or less in the direction of the upper right of the frame. So it puts out these extensions that move it forward. And at a certain point, it begins to move in the other direction, down toward the lower right, as if something attracted it. And then it seems in a way to change its intention and move to the upper right again. So here's this decision-making process in play where the paramecium first moves one way, then heads in another, and then adjusts course and goes back in the first direction. 
Again, a kind of behavior pattern that I think we could identify with, even though no doubt our experience is much more elaborate and uh, involves a lot more conscious consideration, etc. Whatever the amoeba is going through has to be very rudimentary, but again, it could be similar in kind. Or look at two single-celled organisms interacting with one another. And they seem, in a way, to respond to each other's nearness. They, at times, appear to kind of nuzzle or investigate each other. There's a sense in which one is waiting for the other to move out of the way, presumably to get into a field where the chemical signals are quite uh, attractive. So to me, it doesn't seem impossible, certainly, to imagine that these little single cells have some sort of interior experience that explains their behavior. Now, they could simply be robotic with no interior uh, flavor to their experience, no sentience at all. That's possible. But I think it's also possible that they do have that kind of rudimentary sentience. So because the cells in our own bodies are similar in all the important respects to the free living cells that we see in the environment, and because those free living cells appear to have some interior experience, or at least exhibit behavior that's consistent with that, I think it's reasonable to imagine that our individual cells also have a kind of interior experience, each and every one of them. Again, this is not provable, but it's also consistent with what we see, and it's not disprovable. So if our cells are individually capable of very minimal degrees of feeling, and if our larger sense of consciousness and awareness and feeling tone and emotion is simply an aggregate of all the individual feelings of our trillions of cells, then it seems possible to me that when we feel that vibrating interior aliveness that I mentioned earlier, that we're feeling, in a certain sense, the cellularity of our bodies. And I like that possibility because it allows me to connect with my bodily vibratory aliveness with a sense of sweetness and appreciation and affection such as I would offer any sentient being. And so I can consider my body this collective of all these little sentient animals, each of which has its own interior movements of you know, responding to stimuli and satisfying the necessary requirements for continuance and so on. And taken together, I can live in my body with that quality of awe and wonder, gratitude and affection. And so that sparkling aliveness that can be felt, particularly in the palms of the hands, when we allow the hands to become very heavy and warm in our lap and feel the warmth of them and the sensitivity, there's that quality of the body's aliveness that's actually available in every part of the body in every moment when we turn our attention to it. And in fact, scanning the body in order to feel this sparkling aliveness in various regions is a powerful meditation practice that I recommend as a companion to watching this video. So last time we saw how the heart circulates blood through the body proper and also through the part of the body we call the lungs. I'm sure this is review for most folks. But the blood leaves the heart through large vessels we call arteries, flows swiftly to the capillary beds of the body, where it releases oxygen and nutrients, then collects in the veins and flows swiftly back to the heart, which pumps it out to the lungs, where it picks up oxygen and releases carbon dioxide, and then it moves back to the heart and is sent back out to the body, now fully charged with oxygen, etc. So this is the ongoing circulation pattern in each of our bodies in every moment. Let's focus, as we did last time, on the capillary beds of the body. I want to begin by highlighting how, as the blood moves through the capillaries, it slows down and spreads out. 
So it moves through each of these individual capillary channels, gradually giving up oxygen, which is why the schematic blood cells shown here are getting more blue as they move across the capillary bed. And then they gather at the far end of the bed, pick up speed, and then are swiftly conveyed back to the heart. So the capillary bed serves to spread out the blood cells so that they penetrate every part of the organism. So we saw an image like this last time, dividing all the non-pulmonary capillary beds into roughly two categories, those supplying the large muscle groups and those supplying the vital organs of digestion, uh, blood filtering, such as the liver and kidneys, and immune functionality. Now there are many other types of tissue in the body, the skin and so on, but we're looking mainly at these two categories of capillary. And we made the point that when we're in harsh circumstances and need to respond to a threat, that the blood is shunted preferentially to the large muscles to prepare us for fighting or fleeing. And when we're in safe circumstances and we can focus on connecting with others and the body can restore parts that have been injured and it can digest food and concentrate on immune activity and so on, then the blood is shunted away from the large muscles and toward the digestive system. Now that shunting is to a large degree under control of the emotional parts of the brain, as we saw last time, that you know, we can think of as managing a dial that turns one direction or the other. Now, when that dial turns, it's affecting the capillary beds themselves. So when the limbic system gears up and sends out sympathetic activation, nerves through the sympathetic nervous system, and when it releases stress hormones, some of these signals impact the capillary beds. So we're gonna look now at a capillary bed in a bit more detail. So the white channels we see here are the capillaries themselves. You'll notice how they connect a tiny little artery with a tiny little vein. There's also a central channel or shunt going down the middle, which allows blood to pass straight through without infiltrating the individual capillaries. Whether it passes straight through or goes out into the capillaries or not is something that's determined by little cellular sphincters around each capillary base. We're going to look at one of these in schematic. So here are the sphincter cells wrapped around a capillary filled with blood cells. And as they shrink, the amount of blood in the capillary is squeezed down to a minimum effectively restricting the flow. So there's one of those sphincters at the base of each of the capillaries. As long as they're open as they are now, the blood flows through the whole capillary bed in a diffuse way. Now let's imagine that this is a capillary bed in the digestive system, which right now looks nice and pink. It's got plenty of healthy blood flow. And then let's imagine that something difficult occurs, some challenge in the environment. So the body responds by shifting the distribution of blood away from the restorative functions like digestion toward the large muscles. On a local scale, what happens is the capillaries constrict. And when they do so, they close off and the blood no longer moves through the whole capillary bed and instead flows rapidly down the central shunt. And thus the digestive system is relatively deprived of blood flow, shown here in an exaggerated form as a kind of gray coloration indicative of the loss of that healthy pink perfusion. Now this situation is compounded if there's been trauma because then there's a relative lockdown with the body permanently in the state of favoring large muscles over digestion. And this can be one explanation for chronic digestive issues. Well, of course, we want to be more fluid than that and not to be locked into a state of continual arousal. And this series, as well as many other series in the Mindful Biology program, 
are all directed toward helping us regain a healthy, calmer state of fluid existence. One way to encourage more fluidity is to maximize our experience of calmer, safer situations. If we can set up our local environment to be as calm and safe as possible, that of course is very helpful and important. But even when things are a little more chaotic than that, we can build out a sense of warmth and safety by using the powers of visualization and imagination reviewed last time. And when the body feels safe and supported, then the capillaries can reopen, the sphincters can expand, and the blood can perfuse more broadly through the capillary bed. And the nice pink color returns. The, the digestive organs now have plenty of blood flow. Food can be digested more easily. Now the capillary bed is under the indirect control of the limbic system as noted. So there are neurons in the brain that reside within that limbic system, shown here in enormous magnification, shown schematically with all these different colors. So those neurons are densely interconnected and collectively they send signals out through the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems and through various neurochemicals that influence the capillary beds around the body. But the capillaries are influenced by other signals also. In particular, immune cells have the capacity, many of them, to release chemicals that directly affect the capillary beds. So for instance, when we have a local skin infection and it gets red and warm and inflamed, that's happening because the immune cells are releasing signals that tell the capillary beds to open and increase the local blood flow to help fight the infection. So the capillaries are influenced by the distant limbic system and locally by cells in the immediate area. They're also influenced by metabolic products produced by the muscles or whatever other active tissues are nearby. So there are all sorts of inputs and influences that determine the relative availability of blood in any region of the body, the relative openness of the capillaries. And all of these influences are communicating with one another. They're networked, as it were, forming a diffuse intelligence within the body that responds moment to moment in order to help us meet the world in as effective a way as possible. In simplest terms, this means switching back and forth between a more activated and muscle-centric mode when we're in harsh circumstances, versus a more sedate and reparative mode when we're in safe, supportive circumstances. But that's a tremendous oversimplification of an ongoing and very dynamic and complex landscape of bodily change. So the dial that determines where blood is flowing in any given instant is not located in one region of the brain or even one region of the body. It's distributed throughout. So we have this body with this blood flow. And with each heartbeat, the blood leaves the center of the heart and flows out through the large vessels and then flows into the capillaries and perfuses the body with fresh oxygenated red cells. And of course, there's a return cycle that's not being shown in this animation. But the idea here is to build into the consciousness a felt sense of the connection between the center of the chest, the center of the heart, and the capacity of flow to move rapidly out through the large vessels and then to warm and blush and fill all the tissues of the body with all these trillions of flowing cells, this fluid process of circulation, and to begin to use that embedded sense of that movement of blood in the body to support new experiences both as we move through our daily lives and as we meditate more actively with more intention to become more intimate with our ongoing bodily experience in mindfulness. So this concludes the fourth of five sessions about fluidity. Next time, as mentioned, we'll discuss the so-called universal body. 
One of the advantages of focusing on the cellularity of the body that I believe we're feeling when we feel that energetic vibrancy, that aliveness, is that the vibrancy of the body, the diffuse quality of aliveness that we can find in any part of it at any time by paying close and curious attention, that sensation is steady and not much affected by day-to-day -day changes in circumstance. So that if we're a wash in difficult emotions and difficult feelings, we can steady ourselves a bit by turning our attention toward this background quality of pure aliveness, this vibrancy felt throughout. So a practice that I personally use is one of tuning into the aliveness in my hands or my feet or just my limbs or sometimes my whole body, but especially the hands and feet. And I can feel that even if my center, my core, is feeling a fair amount of chaos, my hands often are more steady in a sense of calm, warm vibrancy. And so that steady sensation helps steady my emotions and steady my thoughts. So the point of all of this exploration of the different layers of the body is to help us live within this body with greater ease and equanimity. So I hope you'll continue to practice with me and return to watch the next video in this series.